So I think we will get started. So as we begin, think about a recent notification challenge your program or your office or your state faced, whether at the state or the local level, and what led to that challenge. If it was related to problems with data sharing or data receiving, we hope that today will inspire you with some ideas to make some changes and some improvements in your processes. This presentation is a direct result of requests that came out of some recent listening sessions with Part C and Part B619 staff. A need was identified there for discussions about transition data. And although today we are focusing really closely on the notification piece, we know that there are many data communication needs across the entire transition process that you may need to address. And so we'd love to hear what some of those are. We have a sense of some, but um, would love to hear from you too. And we'll be happy to engage with you on those topics at a later time. So today we have with us, uh, five presenters, me, my name is Ginger Elliott Teague and I am a technical assistant specialist with DAISY. We have Michelle Lewis, a parent center consultant who also works with DAISY, Ruth Littlefield, who is with DAISY and is the lead of the transition team, Howard Morrison, who is the lead for data integration and linking, and then Susan Kessler, who is not with DAISY, but with Alaska's Early Intervention Program. And so we're very glad to have her here with us too. So just as a reminder, um, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the DAISY website later. And we want to welcome all of you who are here, Part C and Part B staff, OSEP and TA centers. We know lots of folks are interested in this topic and have joined us today. So what are we going to do? We're going to start with a brief discussion of the purpose of the webinar, addressing some critical questions um, and important topics, the context, why this is important, what and how notification is done, um, what it looks like and why it's important. Then we're going to jump into the data parts and think about what sharing, linking and integration mean and provide some examples of that both in notification, in practice, and then with some other types of um, data sharing, linking and integration examples to give you a sense of what that might look like broadly. And then share some information about resources and supports after we hear directly from Susan in Alaska. She's gonna share what's going on in her state with notification to give you a sense of what it looks like in practice in her state. Okay, so our purpose today, we want you to enhance your understanding of data sharing, linking and integration for transition notification. And as part of this process, we want to share a little bit about the tools and resources that are available to support that work in your state and with your programs, but to really have you think about some important questions about how to improve data communication for notification, how you can improve efficiency for staff and families, how you can increase engagement across all programs and families, and how you can improve accountability. So this might mean improving your data flows to increase efficiency and program outcomes. It might mean, um, recognizing the problems and the bottlenecks you're facing and where you might tweak your processes to um, reduce those bottlenecks. Okay, so why improve data communication? Mallory, yes, thank you. We know that the transition between C and B presents challenges for both programs. Um, and notification is a key part of that. So you may have missing or late notifications. You may have disconnected LEA and SEA notification. Those are um, those don't always happen together in states. And so your processes may be inefficient. Um, you may feel disorganized. You may feel that there's some wasteful documentation if you're mailing letters um, through the post office, for example. And all of these may lead to burdened families and a lack of service continuity. Or you may have other common 
you may have some other challenges that we haven't listed here. Um, and I won't ask you to raise your hands, but think about which of these your offices have faced recently. And if none of these, we want to hear from you um, about what's working well in your state. But we know that um, whether you have these challenges or not, you may have additional goals that you want to try to meet. You may want to reduce your staff workload if your processes are labor intensive. You may want to increase LEA engagement in the um, referral process. And you may want to um, use your data more productively to answer service questions and program questions to, um, to inform transition more broadly or to inform um, outcomes later on. And some of those critical questions, program questions, may include um, what percent of notifications from Part C to Part B were made in a timely manner, for example. And if you have missing or late notifications, why were they missing or late? What's going on in your processes that is not getting those where they need to be on time? Uh, maybe you want to know what percent of the children exiting from Part C at age three were found eligible for Part B services and how many subsequently had an IEP. And after notification, if you have children who did not proceed through to um, have an IEP in place by the third birthday, why did that happen? Did families drop out of the process? Did they refuse to continue? Did um, you have a lot of children not determined eligible? So some of these types of questions, you need to have a lot of data in place in order to answer them. And hopefully some of what we're talking about today can help you generate that data um, more productively and efficiently to help you answer those questions. Okay, so before we move into the next section, we are really curious about your motivations for being here today. So we have two questions for you. The first one is an open response. Um, just generally, if you would tell us what you are hoping to learn or achieve by participating today. And so that may be, um, you know, a quick sentence or two. Mallory, if you would open that poll. Um, there we go. And so if you would just answer a sentence or two, it's open to 500 characters. I don't know if any of you really want to write that much, but you're welcome to if you have a lot to say. We'll leave it open for about a minute so that you can write those responses in. And once that one is done, we will have a second poll question for you referring directly to those critical questions we mentioned just a bit ago. Great, I see some responses coming in, coming in. Thank you. And if the poll isn't working for you, you are welcome to write that into the chat also. Great, more responses coming in. We'll leave it open for uh, about 30 more seconds, I think. This is great. More than half of you have already responded. Thank you. So I won't be able to read through all of these um, as we proceed, but we will use this information for um, later presentations and for helping us know whether we have met your goals um, uh, by the end of the presentation. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and end the poll. Thank you. Let's see, share results quickly. And I'm not able to see those. Let's see. Okay. And now for the, oh, great. Thank you, Mallory, for showing those. Understanding others' challenges, learn about notification requirements, strategies to reduce untimely transitions. Great. Um, hear concerns and challenges from the field. This is fantastic. I think. 
um, what we have planned is right on target. Hopefully, just, just, just a time yeah. check from just a time check from Ruth here. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's move on to the second poll quickly, and this just flag which um, which critical question is most interesting to you or most um, gets your attention the most about what you would like to be able to answer today. And we'll just spend a few seconds on this so that we can move on to the next section. Okay, a lot of interest in identifying why notifications were missing or late. Okay, question about um, lack of advancement to an IEP. Okay, this is great, thank you, very interesting. Okay, so we'll let you keep answering that while we move on to the next section. And Michelle is gonna talk about notification context. Michelle. Thanks, Ginger. Um, so the next couple of slides are really gonna focus on the basics of transition notification in that context. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, So when we look at notification, the basics for the IDEA um, requirements, OSEP issued a response to NICS on March 17, 2023. Um, many of you may have seen um, this memo, and it really outlined in a question and answer format some very specific, it was reiterating guidance that has been given in the past. Um, and what that guidance went on to say is that the Part C lead agency um, must provide the SEA and the LEA notification of toddlers who are potentially eligible for Part B services. And these, this notification of potentially eligible, as Ginger referenced earlier, goes both to the SEA as well as the LEA, but the when those things happen to the corresponding SEA or LEA may differ um, depending on how you have your system set up. Um, the key in terms of timeline for both is not fewer than 90 days before a child turns three. Um, many states also have opt-out policies, which we'll talk about um, I'm sorry, we are gonna talk about opt-out policies next, but many states have in their policies and procedures definitions of potentially eligible. Um, and so you can look at your state's policies and procedures, um, see what the potentially eligible guidance is. This um, written information about what is potentially eligible is really helpful when you're talking to families. Um, because it helps them understand the process of notification and what will be shared and what it means to be potentially eligible based on, on your state's definition. Next slide. So when we look at the requirements, um, again, we've talked about that there is SEA and LEA um, notification. Um, notification constitutes a referral. So the NICS letter was clear about that, that notification is a referral to the SEA and the LEA of residents from the early intervention program. And it's required for all children served by Part C who are that potentially eligible, unless the state has an opt-out policy that is approved by OSEP. And so, <clears throat> and so you can take a look at the, the NICS letter um, but it also talks about that, yes, OSEP have to approve it, but you also have to have a very specified time frame for which families can object to notification or uh, um, opt out of that notification period. So it's a, it's a very specified time period um, in which parents, family members have been fully informed um, about the notification process, what's going to go um, without their permission, because this isn't about families opting in, it's about families 
um, opting out. Um, so to object to that disclosure, disclosure of um, personally identifiable information. So we do have in a couple places linked in this presentation, the updated policy letter from OSEP. And there it's also at the end of the presentation as well. Next slide. So in terms of the data elements, um, NICS, the NICS letter goes on to talk about that the required elements that um, are not about family permission is the child's name and date of birth and the parent's contact information, which would include name, home, um, and email addresses, as well as the phone number. And then the piece in, <clears throat> excuse me, this green box below talks about um, for ensuring the implement implementation of IDEA Part B child find, sharing may also include the Part C service coordinator's name, contact information, as well as languages spoken by the child and parent or parents to assist the LEA in meeting their specific child find responsibilities. It's also important when you're thinking about your notification system that you can also have um, parent signed consent to share more information with the LEA um, and things like Part C eligibility category, their entry date, their IFSP, so that that LEA has more information in which um, to use to move through the process. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ginger, I believe, again, who's going to talk about the variation um, in potential notification process, as well as looking at degree of automation. Thank you, Michelle. So states can vary a lot on the data elements that are shared, but also other aspects of the process. So how often is notification shared? Is it daily? Is it real time? You may have weekly or monthly reports instead, and that can vary both at the um, across states, but also within a state, the differences between LEA and SEA notification. Um, format may differ. So who notifies and how is that notification happening? Is it happening through a report to a data system or is it through, as I mentioned earlier, through the post office in a letter that is mailed to the LEA. It may be automated. Reports may be aggregated or they may be individual. And then, of course, as Michelle talked about, what information is shared? Is just the required information shared or is there more that's provided with parent consent? All of this variation has major implications for program workload, both on the Part C side and the work required to make the notification, as well as on the Part B side to receive and process that notification. And so we developed this fun little chart on the next slide to sort of map out what um, the various methods that notification can take depending on how much automation is involved and how frequently that occurs. So one of the ways states can vary in their approach to notification is the format. So specifically how automated and how aggreg aggregated the data communication is. So we have several examples here. In the bottom left quadrant of the graph shows a method of a person sending a periodic report generated by hand. One person generates the report, maybe listing all of the children potentially eligible for Part B services who have reached transition age in the past month, let's say. This method would be pretty labor intensive, but it is straightforward. You have verified the list and can send it to the SEA. This might be more common for an LEA level report where the number of children could be fairly small. So one program office may send a report monthly by hand to the local LEA, for example. But aggregated reports um, must be linked on the Part B side, especially at the state level, leading to a higher workload for staff on the Part B side. At the top right of the chart is sort of an opposite approach, full automation in real time creating and updating records in both programs without a lot of manual labor. So the system sends individual notifications in real time. So on a specified date, 
um, when a child reaches a specific age, for example, the report, the system sends the notification to the Part B program at the SEA and the LEA level. We don't actually know of any state that's doing this, um, but it is a potential example of a very highly automated, highly frequent process. Uh, none of these is right or wrong. As you can see, there's lots of different ways to do this, but they do differ on how they impact the workload at every level for both the EI and the early childhood special education programs. More automation generally means notification is less labor intensive for everyone involved. So we do um, generally recommend that you try to make your processes more automated as your data systems improve. This is one of the primary benefits of moving toward greater data integration. You see greater work efficiency, generating efficiencies for families as well, not just your workforce, and better timeliness in service continuity for children. Of course, automation as well as manual work depends on the quality of the data entry at the local level and how those records are managed. If you have data entry challenges that exist, then no process changes will improve that notification process. So ensuring high quality data entry, of course, is the very first step to ensuring that notification happens timely. So Howard is going to talk next about the various ways programs can share, link, or integrate data. Great, thanks so much, Ginger. Uh, so states and territories use a variety of approaches to answer critical questions that cannot be addressed by one data system alone. So sharing, linking, and integrating data really start with a desire to use data from other sources so they can better inform your Part C and Part B619 programs. Next slide, please. So it's important to start this conversation with some technology level setting. So each approach is slightly different in definition um, and its context and how it's applied. So let's now talk through some of those definitions. For data sharing, here really is the practice of providing partners with access to information they can't access in their own data systems. So in this case, data are typically sufficient for the recipient's needs. However, data sharing may occur once or repeatedly, depending on the agreed upon terms. So the data sharing allows stakeholders to learn from each other and collaborate on shared uh, priorities. For data linking, uh, this happens uh, when manually connecting extracted information about an entity. So this could be child, service provider, um, services um, from one data source with the information related to that same entity from another data source. So this may occur once or repeatedly as well, kind of depending on those terms and agreements um, identified. For data integration, this is the combining of data from disparate sources into a single data system uh, to merge information about different entities in one location. So in this case, it's maintained systematically through um, data management plans. And a complete data integration solution really encompasses the discovery, the cleansing, uh, the monitoring, the transforming and delivery of data from a variety of sources. So now that reviewed the, dis the definitions, uh, let's talk about what these look like in context with some examples. And so we'll start with data sharing and some general examples are providing aggregate 619 program participation counts for three-year-olds to the Part C office. Uh, providing a list of secondary students with grade and disability category to Department of Rehabilitation Services. Some notification um, examples include sending a monthly or quarterly report of children potentially eligible for Part B uh, to the state education agency uh, that will be used outside the SEA system. 
sending individual letters of notification uh, or referral uh, to the local LEA when a child is determined to be potentially eligible uh, for Part B data. Uh, data sharing is generally fairly easy to reproduce over time, uh, but can be time consuming on both the sending and receiving sides. And uh, data sharing for notification um, can be prone to delayed information because it relies heavily on individual time, which in some cases is more prone to errors due to the manual work. That said, it can support you know, relationship building, um, especially at the local level by increasing the frequency of communication between BNC program personnel. Uh, for data linking, some general examples are providing annual Part C eligibility and enrollment status to the Department of Health for children identified by the state early hearing uh, detention and intervention program. In this case, Eddie would first provide a list of children uh, to Part C on whom it needs updated Part C data. Then Part C links its own data to the Eddie list at the child level but the linked data set are shared back to Eddie. Another example would be providing Part B eligibility data and enrollment outcomes for children to Part B by the Part C program for its federal exit report on a quarterly basis. A notification example includes sending a periodic report of children who have been deemed eligible, potentially eligible for Part B uh, to the SEA with common unique child IDs to manually upload Part B data system, which may or, not, may or may not notify the LEA simultaneously. So data linking requires more expertise to link the reports based on common identifiers, which sometimes must be created, but less prone to error because there is less manual work. Data linking still must be repeated periodically and staff must be skilled in the processes um, linking data sets at the state level may, may not also at the same time support LEA notification, which may rely on other processes such as emailing individual notifications specifically. For data integration, some examples are um, the state foster care database auto updates a child's status and contact information in the state public health data system. Part C system auto reports child eligibility and individualized family service plan status to the statewide longitudinal data system in the Department of Education upon enrollment. A notification example includes the Part C data system generates a digital notification for each child who has been determined potentially eligible for Part B that is then sent to Part B data system at the SEA and simultaneously notifies the LEA in its own data system. So data integration requires a lot of upfront work, but once it's established, um, then it, the, it's minimal to maintain. So in this context, it does not rely on manual data sharing, um, so there's much less prone to errors being happening there. So it's also worth noting that uh, the trigger for notification may still be reliant on manual data entry, which may be done timely, especially when the child is older and approaching their third birthday. Howard, this is Ruth. I just had a comment in the chat um, asking about permissions from families, and I wanted to reiterate what Michelle brought up before, which is that there, there are those basic factors that are required that don't require permission, but when you go into additional um, data sharing, either from C to B or any of the data from B to C, you would always require parental permission. We're just describing what the different levels of the data systems are, whether you're sharing, linking, or integrating, but you always have to be careful about those parent permissions. Right. Thanks, Ruth. Okay. So we're going to go on to two quick poll questions. Um, so now that we've reviewed kind of those discussions and definitions and approaches, um, just want to get a, some insights on uh, where you all are in respect to data, data sharing, data linking, and data integration. And so our first poll is around from Part C to Part B, 
619 SEA and then Part B SEA to Part C. And so indicating if your state is currently sharing data files, providing data to be linked with Part B records, integrating both programs data or unsure. And these both should come up together um, and we can then review those results. We've got about 20%, oh, jumping up to 30%. We'll maybe allow another 15, 20 seconds. We've got about 50% that have participated. All right, I think we've got most of those folks uh, completing their poll. So Mallory, if we want to just share that, that would be great. Um, so we've got about 52% uh, that have indicated that they're sharing data files, 13% uh, uh, that um, are providing data to be linked with Part B records, about 4% that are integrating both programs data, uh, 26 um, that are unsure, and then 4% uh, uh, put other. For the second poll, um, we've got about 16% that are sharing data files, about 0% uh, that are providing data to be linked with Part C records, 5% uh, um, that are integrating both programs data, about 74% uh, unsure, and then 5% uh, of others. And if folks uh, responding other feel inclined to share that in the chat, um, we'd love to hear um, some of those other responses um, that are coming in. So, okay, I think we can move to the next slide, Valerie. Okay, so we are lucky to have uh, Susan Kessler join us today. She is the Early Intervention Infant Learning Program Unit Manager for the State of Alaska uh, Senior and Disability Services uh, Department at the Department of Health. Um, she's going to share a bit about the approach and process uh, that Alaska has taken, their challenges and next steps. So if you have any questions for Susan, feel free to type them in the chat or we can allow for a few minutes um, at the end of her presentation for just a, a brief Q&A. So Susan, take it away. Thanks, Howard. Thanks for inviting me uh, to talk about our uh, notification, LEA notification system. Um, I also serve as the data manager for the state of Alaska, and we kind of got uh, refocused on LEA notifications this year after we had a data system outage. So we've had an automated LEA notification system in Alaska for quite a while, but when we had to rebuild our database from scratch, we got to think about how was it working and how would we like it to work. Um, so really, we've been focusing on building that data consistency between Part C and B on both the state and local level in bringing the LEA and SEA notification data together um, because we do have a lot of discrepancies. Another thing we have going on right now, we've, we've recently changed our notification age from 27 months to 30 months. So we're trying to implement that as well. In Alaska, we have 15 regional um, infant learning programs and we have 52 school districts. So we have um, quite a bit going on. Um, what we are doing now in our state is our SDA state level notification data is automated through our data system. And um, that happens on a daily basis. So the data is uploaded to a data system that our partners at Department of Education have access to in real time. Um, and so they're basically able to, you know, retrieve their notification data that's 
mostly real time within a day um, whenever they need to. And then on a local level for LEA notifications, local programs are generating uh, a report from our data system and manually somehow through secure email or fax or snail mail or however they're deciding to do it locally, sharing that information. Um, so we do share all of the data elements that are required and we have a couple bonus items like the name of the family service coordinator and the primary language of the family. Our data system is also um, slightly complicated by our opt out policy that we do have and I'm told by OSEP we're the first state that also allows families to opt back in after they've opted out so just to really complicate things. Um, we added that option for families. So you could go ahead to the next slide. This is just a screenshot with all of the data removed of what our notification dashboard looks like for our partners at Department of Education. So you can see it has um, the name of the infant learning program regionally that the child is enrolled in. Um, the child's in basic info, contact information, all, all of the things that um, you would expect to see on this report. So uh, DEED, um, Department of Ed can log in at any time and see this report um, updated in real time. And we do have kind of a call out for children who had late notification because we found that's a data complication as well, is that um, those late notifications that happen after 33 months can be a little bit of a data issue. Um, so let's see, um, the other component of this is that the um, Department of Education also receives a weekly email um, uh, reminding them that their data is there. <laughs> so that was something that we ran into a fair amount as well as like they kind of forgot their data was there, never really looked at it. So on the state level, it tends to be utilized um, annually more than in real time. Um, you'll also see on here two columns, the date the SDA was notified, and that is auto-populated on, on the date that the child's name is added to this list. And then the date the LEA was notified is entered manually by local programs. So you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so our challenges that we're really trying to, to work on are closing the gap between SDA and LEA notification data. Um, and a lot of those have to do with um, children. When we had a pretty early notification date, we had it at 27 months. We found that there were a lot of changes between 27 and 33 months, families who moved, families who decided they didn't want referral to their local school district, children who met their milestones and no longer needed services. So we're trying to close that gap. We're trying to really figure out how we're going to implement our um, new opt back in policy. And so we are moving toward kind of a date tracking system for that right now. Um, when children, when families opt out of sharing LEA notification data, it's just a toggle box in our data system. So we're moving toward um, using a date so that we can really capture the date a family opted out of notification. And then if they choose to uh, revoke their opt out, um, the date that it was um, revoked. So challenges of having a notification like system like this is maintaining login, um, having good contact information for the people who have logins for the data system, um, having correct emails um, so that those notifications are going out correctly. Um, and really the harder part for us is the local um, LEA notifications. Um, so we're really strongly encouraging local programs now to use this specific report from our data system and send it to their local school districts. Um, but we have programs doing all different kinds of things around our state and some of their systems are working really well for them. So they're reluctant to change. Um, I would say also something that's unique in Alaska is out of our 52 school districts, 
we have many, the majority only have one or two notifications per year. <laughs> so we have some really tiny school districts um, and really tiny uh, early intervention programs. So notification isn't happening frequently. Um, and then our biggest, our biggest challenge, and probably other states face the same exact challenge, is children who enroll in our program after 32 months and need to have their LEA notification data happen almost immediately. So they enroll at 32 months and 29 days, and we're really required to get that notification over to the LEA and SEA on the same day. Um, we also have children who move around our state a lot. So um, how to handle LEA notifications when children are moving from school district to school district um, is a huge challenge in our state. Um, so yep, you can go on to the, the last slide. Um, the next steps we're really looking at are we did decide to develop an individualized LEA notification form. So that would be for just um, when you have just one specific child to provide notification on to your LEA. Um, so we're using that a lot for those children who enroll after 32 months. Um, some of our local programs have been sending their LEA notification data monthly, and we've found that um, that can be a problem for them in meeting the timeline to ensure that the district has received notification by 33 months. Um, and we are really excited in hopefully our like largest school district, our largest five, our five largest school districts, we're hoping to get them access to their own portal to access their data in real time as well. And if we're able to do that, that will take care of um, that will essentially automate like 90% of our notifications in our state. So our data we think would really improve a lot if we're able to implement that. Um, we've also been doing joint training between the um, our local education agencies and local early intervention programs on things like yes, notification does mean referral and how we're, we're what does that mean and what parent permissions are required for notification versus referral uh, sharing of additional referral information. Um, another challenge that we've had is timely data entry for some of our local programs. So when you have an automated system, it's really only as good as your data entry. And that's a huge factor and um, potentially an issue also for those late enrollments that enroll after 32 months. So this year we're getting ready to analyze our data from um, FY23 and um, maybe by December or so, I'll have a better feel for how this is all working. So kind of a very quick down and dirty uh, summary of what we're doing. And I'm not sure if there's time to field any questions. I may have taken up all my time. No, I think we're great on time here. So I'll just pause to see if anyone has. Oh, thank you, Susan. That was great. We greatly appreciate it. But I wanted to pause to see if we have any questions for folks that are on the call um, that might have any questions about um, Susan and Alaska's process, some of the challenges, um, or any kind of next steps questions for her. Question in the chat uh, asking, how do you incorporate opt-out into the automation? Yeah, so right now when the report is generated, it just, um, if the local program has checked a box that is called opt-out in that child's database record in our statewide data, data system, um, it will suppress notification for that child. Right, thanks for that question, Mary. And um, any other questions for Susan? I know that was a lot of information quickly. So my email address is there. If you want more information, just reach out. And we've got a request in the chat for a copy of your opt-out and opt-back-in policy because in Arizona, they're having a similar problem 
uh, and are looking for ideas on how to address it um, so that, that they're not having things look late. And a lot of kudos for you as well in the chat. That's interesting and nice to hear that Arizona and Colorado are doing that also. So OSA is going to start hearing more about that, sounds like. Great. Thank you. All right. Any other final questions? It's like Colorado allows for that. Um, and Annie asking for a copy, so that's great. I think we can make some good connections here so we can ensure that <clears throat> gets sent to you all and connect you all with that. Um, okay, thank you, Susan. We greatly appreciate um, your expertise and sharing uh, with everyone today. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, so data linking and integration take time, um, expertise, um, and, and state commitment. So let's review some potential next steps uh, for you to consider. So disseminate transition interagency agreements uh, that specifically address data sharing responsibilities and processes um, and provide training to affected Part C and Part B staff. Um, we heard that today through some of uh, Susan's description on what's happening um, in Alaska. Um, also consider the feasibility and benefits of creating and using a single unique child identifier across both Part C and Part B programs. Um, we know in some instances this isn't possible, um, and there are options for matching different IDs and records um, if possible, um, and that would still work um, for linking integration, but you know the single uh, unique ID identifier is kind of a smoother and easier approach if possible. Uh, consider the feasibility and benefits of moving towards a statewide data system uh, to support accurate and efficient transfer of transition data uh, that will, so that really thinks about minimizing manual processing and reducing errors. Um, and this could be through an expansion of your statewide longitudinal data system or potentially your early childhood integrated data system um, if your state has one. Uh, and then lastly here, um, develop processes to allow state and local Part C and B staff real-time access uh, to the same data on transitioning children. Um, and Alaska spoke to how um, they have plans to improve some of this uh, within their state programs. So let, there are a few other ways uh, states and territories can improve their uh, notification uh, practice. One area is to establish routine communication uh, between state and local Part C and Part B program staff. Um, this will allow them to coordinate notification, uh, data sharing to resolve discrepancies and issues, ensure timely and effective access to services and supports for children and their families, it also allows them to build strong relationships to establish uh, consistent communication, um, which is really essential. Uh, another area um, to improve is to establish routine transition notification training and technical assistance for local Part C and Part B program staff. Uh, this really helps to increase transition knowledge, use transition data, to plan and monitor local programs for effective transition services and build interagency relationships. So I'll now turn it over to Ginger to talk about some of the supports and resources available uh, through DAISY and how we might be able to support you going forward after this webinar. And Howard, if I can quickly interject, there's some, some conversations in the chat about the opt-out, a lot of interest in the questions about opting back in and at what age people, uh, children opt out and how that impacts the process. So if folks are interested in a longer discussion, we don't have time today, we can think about when and where that might be appropriate. Thank you, Ginger, go ahead. Yeah, thanks Ruth for bringing that up. And thanks Howard for that overview. Um, for those of you who are interested in data linking as an avenue forward, DAISY has a toolkit on our website that you should check out. It contains a large variety of resources, 
um, ranging from information about building partnerships across agencies, some worksheets to work through um, to help you plan business rules and data sharing and linking, um, checklists to help your state through that process. And um, DAISY TA can also support your state working through that document if you are interested in that. Um, we're also working on a couple of new activities. We're developing a use case that states can use to articulate the need for and value of data linking and integration. Um, and we will be sharing that soon with stakeholders to get their feedback through um, the next activity we're going to talk about. We have a data linking and integration learning community that will be starting at the end of August. That notice and registration will be opening very soon, hopefully this week. Um, and our first topic is going to be transition. So it's going to feed off of our conversations today. We won't look specifically at notification again, but thinking more broadly about the transition process and some of the data communication challenges between Part C and Part B. And that learning community will be for both programs. So it won't be exclusive to early intervention or um, early childhood special education, but everyone is welcome to participate in that. So we hope that you will join us for that. And then of course, DAISY um, is always available to assist with targeted or intensive TA on these topics from helping your state frame the use case for increased integration to helping you um, think through process improvements for transition. So please reach out to your DAISY liaison for more information if you would like some help from us um to work through some of that in, um, that work and then on the next slide we have a list of resource links that we're happy to share with you um, we have some information we've been talking about transition notification and data linking and integration for quite a while now um, this first link here is from i think 2016 and talks about a, examples from kansas and wisconsin um, and how they processed um, and are still processing their notifications. Um, again, we have the DAISY, DAISY data linking toolkit. We have a blog from last year, what's the difference between data sharing, linking and data integration that you may be interested in if you want more background information about those topics. We have the link here to the um, Nix letter for you. And then we have a couple of checklists and tips for the APR specifically, both for indicator C8, part B, about notification, and then um, indicator B12, the early childhood transition timeliness indicator. So those may be helpful if you're trying to think through how you're collecting and reporting, especially non-compliance data, um, for those two indicators. Okay, so we have a few minutes left here at the end. If you have additional questions, please type those into the chat um, and we'd be happy to answer those or you're welcome to come off mute. Otherwise, we will be sending out an evaluation survey later today to everyone who participated. We'd love to hear what you thought um, and are glad you joined us. We know that um, improving your notification processes is not easy. There are a lot of moving parts and whether you're moving from sharing to linking or trying to build an integrated process, it's not easy and we um, recognize that and applaud you for thinking about how you can improve your work in this area because it's very important for improving services for children and making sure that their transition is smooth to um, Part B. So thank you for that. And we hope that you learned something today. Glad to have you here. And if there are no questions, we will chat with you later. Thanks for joining us.